folks, this is Pastor Mike Hoggard coming to you from Watchman Studios with another Watchman video broadcast. We were talking last week about the, the major sign of Jesus appearing, his appearing. Now, we know that later he comes to set his foot on the earth and begins to reign having put down most of his enemies, the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. But we know that he is coming to meet us in the air. And the sign of that is that he is coming in the clouds. Where, let's go back and look at where we get that from. Matthew 24, starting in verse 29, immediately after the tribulation of those days, shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light. And the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn. And they shall see, here it is, the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he shall send his angels with the great sound of a trumpet. And they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. So we have, we're looking at several things here in this series. The sign of the clouds. Looking at that. All these stories in the Bible that deal with clouds. Um, God showing up in Exodus 16. The glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. And that's when God gave manna. We're going to look at that. Um, the sound of a trumpet, shouting, the shaking of the heavens. All of these go together. And you see story after story after story in the Old Testament, some in the New, of the shaking, the trumpet, the shouting, the clouds. And what we're doing is we're putting all of these together based upon those things that Jesus told us to look for. So years ago, I threw away all the charts, all of the isms that I used to believe, and I started letting God piece it together from Scripture. This is what I find. We go to Acts chapter 1, verse 9. What did the two angels tell us disciples. What did he tell them? And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? Let's stop right here for a minute. It's because we're supposed to lift up our heads for our redemption draweth nigh. And then be looking down in a pit somewhere for Jesus to come up. That's the other Jesus comes up from a pit. I'm looking at the one who comes down from heaven clothed with a cloud. Okay. Uh, which said, ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? The same Jesus, not another one. This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. And then 1 Thessalonians 4 starts piecing these things together for us. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them, where? In the clouds to meet the Lord. In the air. He is in the air because he is in the clouds with the dead in Christ who have risen first. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, fight like cats and dogs over what these words mean. Oh, that's not what it says, is it? So I, I don't. I don't like to get into debates. 
with my brothers. I love my brethren in Christ. And it doesn't matter if they think I'm nuts for believing the way I do about the translation. I love them anyway. I, I want them to love me because I want them to know that I'm going to stick with this King James Bible no matter what, no matter what I end up believing. And no matter who's right, it's not a contest. It's not a contest about who's right. We're supposed to wherefore comfort one another with these words. When you see somebody having a bad day, tell them, look, I know it seems rough now, but one of these days when Jesus appears in the air, trust me, you won't care about what's going on right now in your life. You won't care. It, you'll say, oh, it's worth it. It was worth every bit of it. We experienced something this week with our radio stations that made all the trouble, all the turmoil, all the things stolen and destroyed by the devil we received word this week that the Kenya government and the Kenya Communication Authority, because of violations, shut down over 120. That was, I was wrong last week when I said 60. It was over 120 radio stations all throughout Kenya. The only two radio stations, one in Samburu and one in Turkana, they both belong to us, and those are the only two radio stations left in operation in those two places. Every other radio station has been shut down, including the Catholic radio station, where they spent God only knows how much money trying to outdo us in Samburu. They got shut down. Now, I can't brag on that because I didn't do it. But it was clear to me that with what the devil tried to do by trying to destroy both of our radio stations and an agent of the devil who was, who was in the process of stealing everything that we owned over there, he got caught, sent to jail, Kenya Communication Authority believed our story that this man had tried to steal everything that we had and we were putting everything back together to do things by the book and they believed us and they left us open in Samburu and they left us open in Turkana. And we're the only two radio stations that survived that purge in Samburu and Turkana. See, I'm telling you this because I'm telling you that we went through a horrible time with what was done to us. And yet, look at what God did with it now. He has magnified the preaching of his word in both Sambru and Turkana and put down all of our enemies against whom we fight. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Somebody say amen. Revelation 1, verse 7. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. Look how, John, look how it said, Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him. And so it is going to be known on that day who God favors when he appears in the clouds, and all of the sudden, we're caught up to be with him and is it possible then that the whole world is going to see us 
with Jesus in the clouds on that day? A cloud of witnesses surrounding Jesus? I think that's extremely possible. And I think that, I think that could very well be what provokes Israel to jealousy. Seeing that us lousy, non-law-keeping, non-Torah-keeping, no, well, they didn't keep the Passover. Yeah, we did. Christ is our Passover. Those Gentiles, filthy Gentiles up there with the Messiah, and it provokes them to jealousy. That, uh, it's just what I think. But anyway, so that's the basis, okay? That's the basis of our understanding that Jesus, all these verses, and there's a bunch more we went through last week, so I'm not going over them again. And God is the same yesterday, today, forever. And so what we're going to do is we're going to go back and we're going to look at stories in the Old Testament that show God, the clouds, and the things that he does in association with that. And what you're also going to see in these stories, not just the God in the cloud, you're going to see trumpets blowing, you're going to see people shouting, you're going to see things shaking. We're going to go through the Bible and look and see what is associated with Christ coming in the clouds so that we will be educated. We will, we will have the knowledge that others won't have because they won't read the Bible and they won't believe the Bible anyway. We'll have that knowledge and understanding and knowing that when we see Jesus in the clouds, that's it, okay? That's it. We're going with him on that day. Now, the first place I want to go to, I like this, one of my favorite places and stories in the Bible because it shows the order of God. Now, some people that follow our ministry, they don't like this. I've already been told that. They, they just don't like, I don't like those numbers thing. And yet, most people do. So let me just show you a fact, okay? The fact is that there is one chapter in the Bible where God introduced manna to the Jews. One chapter. He explained to it to them what it was, what they were to do with it, what they were to not do with it, and the reason why they called it manna is because that's a Hebrew word that means what in the world is that? You ever seen anything like that before? No, I ain't never seen nothing like that before in all my life. What's well, the hillbilly version of the Hebrew, what it means. What it means is, what is it? Because the manna was Christ, and they didn't know it. And it's the word of God, and they didn't know it. So, Exodus 16, which, if you count, Genesis has 50 chapters. So if you add 16 to 50, what do you get? 66. So we're in the 66th chapter of the Bible, and this is where God introduces a story about giving them this daily bread from heaven, which is his word, right? Exodus 16, 10. And it came to pass as Aaron spake unto the whole congregation of the children of Israel that they looked toward the wilderness and behold, the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. So this is telling you that this not only happened way back then in Moses' days, but this is going to happen in the future when the Lord appears in the cloud. This is going to happen. As Solomon said in Ecclesiastes 1, the thing that hath been is the thing that shall be, and there is no new thing under the sun. Exodus 16, verses 4 and 5. Here's what God said exactly in the King James. Here's what God said. Then said the Lord unto Moses, quote, 
Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a certain rate every day, that I may prove them whether they will walk in my law or no. And it shall come to pass that on the sixth day they shall prepare that which they shall bring in, and it shall be twice as much as they gather daily. Why? Because they're getting ready for the Sabbath, which is the seventh day. A day with the Lord is as a thousand years. And that's the millennial reign of Christ that they're preparing for right here in this story. And oh, by the way, remember, we're in the 66th chapter of the Bible. And it just so happens that what I have underlined here in Exodus 16 verses 4 and 5, if you count, you stop the video right now and take a pin like this one, only this one shoots. Okay? Take a pen and go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. You count all those words out there. 66. Exactly. In a King James Bible only. Now that's a fact. It's a fact. It's a fact that we're in the 66th chapter of the Bible, and it's a fact that those words are 66 words exactly. Now, you don't like me. You don't like me counting things in the Bible. You don't like the, uh, maybe the assumptions I make or the, um, the decisions that I make or what I think it means. You may not like any of that, but you can't deny that that's 66 words and you can't deny that that's 66 chapter of the Bible. You can't deny either one of those because they're both a fact. Now that may grind you the wrong way, but it's a fact. Okay, so what's God telling them here? Is that when I appear in the cloud, I'm going to give my bread back to Israel again so that they can live once again. See, they've been starving to death. God, God, what did God tell them in Amos? Come, they're coming a day when I'm going to send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread, but a famine of hearing the words of the Lord. And I believe when, we, when Jesus appears in the clouds and we are caught up with him, that God is going to restore himself, the bread from heaven, not the old manna from Moses, but Jesus himself to the people of Israel. Exodus 19, which is the 69th chapter of the Bible, the 70th chapter is where the Ten Commandments are, but this is their preparation to get the Ten Commandments. Now, I don't know that that means anything, the number 69, but look at what it says. And the Lord said unto Moses, Lo, I come unto thee in a thick cloud. So he's coming in a cloud, just like we're looking for him to come in a cloud, that the people may hear when I speak with thee and believe thee forever. And Moses told the words of the people unto the Lord, and the Lord said unto Moses, Go unto the people and sanctify them today and tomorrow, and let them wash their clothes and be ready against the third day. For the third day the Lord will come down in the sight of all the people upon Mount Sinai. Now, let's stop right here. Let's examine this for a minute and see what it says. First of all, we have God telling them, I'm going to come down in a thick cloud. We already know that. And we know that when the Lord appears in that cloud, that we're going to be caught up with him. But what else is he going to do when he appears in that cloud and the dead in Christ rise first and the which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them? What else is going to happen on that day? God said that he is going to tell the people, sanctify them today and tomorrow. That's a two-day time prophecy. And how long is a day? It's a thousand years. So 2,000 years, let's say from Christ's first coming, be ready against the third day, which would be the millennial reign, the thousand years of rest, and tell them to wash their clothes because they're filthy. And what did Jesus say to the Laodicean church? I counsel to buy me of me 
uh, clean linen. I'm just kind of paraphrasing here. can't remember exactly what he said, but you get it. We must appear before Christ with clean clothes on, and the only way they can, get, they can be clean is to be washed in the blood of the Lamb. Yes, the Jews are going to believe that Jesus' blood sanctifies them, not bulls and goats. Mm -mm. Then it says, be ready against the third day, for the third day the Lord will do what? Come down. Isn't that what he's doing? He's coming down in the sight of all the people. We just read that in Revelation chapter 1, and every eye shall see him on that day. Mm, mm, mm. Isn't this beautiful? Are, isn't it great to be able to comfort people with these words rather than to roll them up and beat people over the face with them and say, oh, you're wrong about the rapture. Isn't it better to just comfort people? Amen. So then he says in verse 16, and it came to pass on the third day, just like he said, he's going to do it in the morning. That means at the beginning of the thousand years, not toward the end. That's where Satan gathers the armies one last time. So it's at the beginning of the thousand year reign. The day of the Lord. The day of the Lord is both a 24-hour day and a thousand-year day. It's both of them. That there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud upon the mountain and the voice of the trumpet exceeding loud, which is what we're waiting to hear. And Moses brought, uh, and so that all the people that was in the camp trembled, there's the shaking mentioned in Revelation chapter 6 and, and Matthew 24, and Moses brought forth the people out of the camp to meet with God. And they stood at the nether part of the mount. Now, just so that there's no misunderstanding, that, that you think I've got my theology all wrong, like, what, pastor, you think that God's going to gather the Jews at Mount Sinai again? No. Because I know the Bible clearly tells us something different. Hebrews 12 tells us that when Christ does this the second time, it's not going to be at Mount Sinai. It's going to be at Mount Zion. Hebrews 12, 18. For ye are not come unto the mount that might be touched, and that burned with fire, nor unto blackness, and darkness, and tempest, and the sound of a trumpet, and the voice of words, which voice they that heard entreated that the word should not be spoken to them any more. For they could not endure that which was commanded, and if so much as a beast touched the mountain, it shall be stoned or thrust through with a dart. By the way, a beast is going to try to ascend that mountain, isn't he? Think about it. And so terrible was the sight that Moses said, I exceedingly fear and quake, but ye are come unto Mount Zion and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect, and to Jesus, not Moses. Moses isn't going to bring them up there. Jesus is. Moses is dead. Jesus is alive forevermore. Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, not the old. It, the Jews, just in case you don't know me and what I believe, and you want to accuse me of believing that I think the Jews are going to restore um, ox killing again, and goat killing, and lamb killing again. <laughs> I don't believe it. Jesus has already sacrificed the only sacrifice allowed 
for the perfection of mankind, Jew or Gentile. Because Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling, that speaketh better things than that of Abel from the Old Testament. Abel's blood spoke good things. Jesus' blood speaks better things. And it's all going to happen for us and for Israel on that day. God's going to translate us and then save Israel on that day. Mm. Hebrews 12, 25. See that you refuse not him that speaketh. For if they escape not who refused him that spake on earth, much more shall not we escape if we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven, whose voice then shook the earth, but now uh, he hath promised, saying, Yet once more, I shake not the earth only, but also heaven. Stop right here. What, have, what did Matthew 24 tell us was going to happen before Jesus came in the clouds? He was going to shake the earth and the heavens. What did we find out in Revelation 6 at the opening of the sixth seal? That God's going to shake the heavens and the stars are going to fall from heaven like figs out of a fig tree when she is shaken of a mighty wind. So here we have the shaking taking place just like in Matthew 24, Revelation 6. That takes place, Christ appears in a cloud. Yet, uh, So he says, yet once more I shake not the earth only but also heaven. And this word, yet once more, signifieth the removing of those things that are shaken as of things that are made, that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. Wherefore we, receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. Now let me stop and just kind of comfort you with these words. Don't quit believing. Don't quit believing. Don't do it. It's not worth it. Even though God is going to shake both the heavens and the earth, and it's going to scare the bowel contents out of everybody on the earth, they're going to lose it all over the place. God says, if you'll let me uphold you with my grace, not with your works, but with my grace, then you'll stand just like the city that I built for you will stand because it cannot be shaken and torn down. It can't be. So God says, trust him and don't stop believing. Don't, don't stop trusting in the Lord. Hang on to your faith, people. Verse 28, wherefore we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. That matches again, Matthew 24, 29, immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the stars shall fall from heaven. The powers of the heaven shall be shaken and then shall appear the sign of the son of man in heaven and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn and they shall see the son of man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. So what, does, what order does your Bible tell you that everything's going to happen? First of all, the shaking of both earth and heaven. And God says to us then, hold on. Keep trusting me. I'll, I'll uphold you with grace so that you cannot fall. I'll strengthen your feeble knees so that you can keep standing. And then he said, once all that's happened, then... The clouds are coming. And when the clouds come, don't be, af don't be afraid. Look up in those clouds. Because then you're going to see me, the Son of Man, appearing in those clouds. And that's when I'm going to send my angels out to gather together my elect. And the gathering 
is another part of this that little ways down the road we're gonna we're gonna look at the gathering you're gonna love that okay I promise you now all the way back to the tabernacle let's look at the 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 Old Testament told us of one two three temples and or tabernacles of God there was Moses tabernacle Solomon's temple and then the rebuilt temple that later on in Jesus time was called Herod's temple it's called Herod's temple because it kind of got into disarray and Herod kind of fixed it up and added a bunch of stuff to it for his own glory okay he just wanted his name added to it Herod's temple it's God's temple but what we're going to notice is that every time Every time that they built a temple, the cloud went in it. Moses' temple, Exodus 40, verse 33. And he reared up the court round about the tabernacle and the altar and set up the hanging of the court gate. So Moses finished the work. Then a cloud. Mo Notice this. Moses finished the work. I'm telling you, when Jesus is done with this world saving the Gentiles, remember what Paul said, beloved, be not ignorant of this mystery, that darkness, that blindness uh, in part is happened unto Israel until the fullness of the Gentile be come in. So that is Moses finished the work. Because the body of Christ, when he comes the second time, is going to be us and all of those who have died in Christ before him who have been translated up. We are his body. That's his temple now. Okay? So Moses finished the work. Then a cloud covered the tent of the congregation and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Remember when we saw that in Exodus 16? The glory of the Lord in the cloud. And Moses was not able to enter into the tent of the congregation because the cloud abode thereon. You know what that means? Moses always represents the law. And when Moses can't go in, do you know what that means? Those who are trying to live by keeping the law aren't going. Do you know why? Not even Moses kept the law. Moses killed a man, cold-blooded murder, thou shalt not kill. Moses struck the rock when he was told to speak to it. God said, uh-uh, you're not going to my promised land. Because the cloud abode thereon and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Now that was the tabernacle of Moses. Now we skip to the temple of Solomon. Same thing. 1 Kings 8.10, And it came to pass when the priests were come out of the holy place that the cloud filled the house of the Lord so that the priest could not stand to minister because of the cloud. See, there it is again. The Levite priests who are under the law, cloud shows up, they can't stand. They're all falling down on the ground going, uh. For the glory of the Lord had filled the house of the Lord. You see, we had two witnesses here telling you, all of you, I weep over a friend who has turned his back on grace and gone after law keeping. And I weep for anybody Who has turned their back on the grace of God and has has invented a gospel either by well we go to church on Saturday so therefore we honor God or we keep the feast days so therefore we honor God we don't do Christmas and Easter so therefore we honor God and all you guys are pagan and you're not going to heaven you're not saved or we didn't get vaccinated so 
we, we honored God and all of you that got vaccinated, you're not going to heaven. And there are people who believe that. We don't wear masks. And God knows that Christians shouldn't wear masks. I've had people say that. People were still saved by grace through faith, and that not of ourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And I don't care what work you add to it. If you think that your good deeds or your lack of a few bad deeds is going to get you to heaven, when the cloud appears, you're falling down. As simple as that. Acts, Acts chapter 15, verse 16. After this, I will return. This is the new temple. After this, I will return and will build again the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down, and I will build again the ruins thereof, and, will, and I will set it up. Hebrews 8, 2. A minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched, and not man. 1 Thessalonians 4, 17, Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Who is going to make the last temple? Not Moses, not Solomon, not the Freemasons, not the Jews who live in Jerusalem right now. They're not going to do it. Only Jesus is going to build his own tabernacle, which the Lord pitched and not man. And when he builds this tabernacle, just like the one in the, that Moses built, the cloud came in it, didn't it? Just like the one Herod, uh, Solomon built, the cloud went in it, didn't it? And just like the one that Jesus built, out of all of our new bodies, the cloud is going to go in it, won't it? And Jesus will be in that cloud and he will dwell in us forever and ever and ever. What a great Thing that's going to be when it happens. Can I get somebody to say amen to that? I've got a lot more to give you. I'm going to cut this in two parts. You wait till next week when part two comes out.